pretty soon an old man with a long white beard come out of a piano box on the edge of the arms and come over to warm his hands by our fire. He didn't say anything until some of the boys left to catch a drag that was just beginning to move out. Then the old man, who just come out of the piano box, says, It's pretty tough to be right in the drags on a night like this. I know I was a bum once myself. Although he was recognized in his lifetime, I think more has occurred, as it often occurs to a radical artist, has occurred after his death. His main contributions have been uh, in the area of revitalizing the materials of music and questioning the inherited canon and uh, structural materials from Western music tradition by uh, rethinking, going back to, to very ancient Greek roots, rethinking the fundamental uh, scale systems, tuning systems, he was really the, the, the first major creative figure, although there were certain surviving elements of interest through the 19th century of people who were interested in tuning systems other than 12-tone equal temperament. He was really the first major composer of the 20th century to, to really, in a systematic way, create a body of work that uh, was based on a very different set of assumptions. Okay, I'm going to try and explain in a few words what Harry did with microtones. And, and it's a difficult explanation because uh, most people that are watching this documentary may not know the musical terminology. So the analogy that I like to give that, that I think everyone understands is that we can go to a, an art supply or a stationery store and we can buy a box of crayons. And some of the boxes have eight in them, some of them have 12, some of them have uh, 72 and some of them have 144. If you buy the box of crayons that has 12 in it, then you are stuck with those 12 colors. And that is exactly what the, every tuning system in the world buys a box of crayons that has a certain set number of possibilities in it. The western scale that's in common use, which is called 12-tone equal temperament, is basically a box of 12 crayons. What Harry Parch wasn't satisfied with was that limitation. And so he, he basically created instruments that in a way bought the larger box of crayons so that he could have more subtle colors um, to use in his compositions. This is Harry Parch's Chromalodeon. It's actually Chromalodeon 1 and it's uh, a, a second Chromalodeon 1 because we've rebuilt his, his first one. It's a 43 tones per octave keyboard instrument. inscription given to me by a Japanese calligrapher has hung on my studio walls in recent years and it says though homeless you make a shrine wherever you are at the moment my shrine happens to be in Chicago and if it is a shrine it becomes one only through the musical instruments that I have around me these are unusual in size shape and philosophic purpose. They are a musical necessity because I am essentially not an instrument builder but a composer. I am a philosophic music man who long ago was seduced into musical carpentry. He was very much of the tradition that you could think of like as Levi Strauss called the, the bricolure, the, the person who takes various elements and integrates them and finds whatever they need out of the environment they're living in. And in, in Parch's case he did that not only in how he built the instruments, making them out of things as common as liquor bottles or light bulbs or uh, uh, other kinds of, of objects that he could integrate as percussion sources, 
but, but he'd always do that in a way in which they were fully integrated as musical instruments. They were, always took on another level rather than just arbitrarily uh, making sounds that were, uh, that were interesting for just the sake of sound. He always integrated them into his tuning system and organized them in that way. are an integral part of the development of the tuning system because if Harry was a composer that came along maybe 30, 40 years later uh, when there's the electronic means of doing this, I'll tell you it would have been a lot easier to use electronics than to build instruments. Harry took the difficult way with this. The thing about the instruments is that some of them are more idiosyncratic to his music than others, but all of them have the possibility to be used by someone else in a new way, as if he had invented the clarinet instead of the chromolodeon. Whoever invented the clarinet or was the first one to use it, uh, you know, didn't exhaust its possibilities. And if, if Harry, it's, it's an argument in favor of how well he built instruments, actually, that they can survive, um, that they're beautiful for his music, the perfect manifestation for his music, and yet they're so useful to others as well. Unlike with Beefheart and some of the other more eccentric musicians that Waits was drawn to in the 1980s, he had been introduced to Parch's work early on. His close friend Francis Thumb, whom he had met in the late 60s while in San Diego, was a classically trained musician and a member of the Harry Parch Ensemble, and he would become a key collaborator during Waits' artistic reinvention. Well, Harry moved to San Diego in the either late 60s, early 70s, and, uh, which is where I first met him, which was in probably 1970 is when we first met. So the ensemble that formed around that, those years were all musicians, largely musicians that were in San Diego, with a couple of exceptions, some people who were in Los Angeles. Francis was one of those. He was actually, we were actually students together at San Diego State University uh, at that time. And uh, he had been uh, Tom's, one of Tom's closest friends throughout their adolescent years. And, and actually, a, a lot of Tom's early music is sort of recounts of their adventures together. And so I know that's how the, the, Tom's awareness of the music came about, was through Francis. When Tom is uh, starting to work on Swordfish Trombones, uh, he's reconnecting with his old friend, Francis Thumb, uh, who is a, a music professor and uh, associated with San Diego State uh, University and uh, plays in the Harry Parch Ensemble, where Harry Parch uh, granted all of his instruments, these beautiful architecturally structured but unusual instruments uh, to them. And, uh, and this, is a, this is an open space like Beefheart for Tom to pursue um, music as sound. You know, that, that sensibility is very appealing to Tom, and the freedom uh, of Parch's example is extremely important to him. I can construct music out of anything